each every one and do great mighty things in the lives of everyone here today in Jesus name. We're going to pray together now. I want you to close your eyes and pray and tell the Lord that today's Bible study will enrich your life, will turn you around, and will do the very best in your life. That the purpose of God for bringing you here, the purpose of the Lord, for you being in the kingdom at such a time like this, that that purpose will be fulfilled and that your life will bring glory to the Lord. Tell the Lord that today, you don't want to be at the Bible study just to be here. You want the Lord to do something definite and something spectacular in your life. That your life will be meaningful in the kingdom. You'll be profitable to the Lord and to the King of kings, to the Lord of lords, and to the people of God as well. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you at this time and bless your name. We thank you for your word. What a great gift you have given us this word of God. And what a privilege we have for studying the word of God every time we come here and every time we listen to the word, every time we go through the pages of scripture. You do speak to our hearts. Lord, we pray that today you speak to us at the point of our need in Jesus' name. For those who are yet to know you, Lord, we pray you open their eyes so that they will know you and they will give their lives to you and be what you want them to be and for those of us who have just come into the kingdom lord we pray that you will grow even in the lord in jesus name for those of us who have been in the lord for such a long time we pray lord that this word of god will not be stale that it will be real and it will be bringing fruit in our lives even as we are growing older and older in the things of the lord in jesus name once again lord open our eyes to see what we ought to see to know what we ought to know and then give us the grace to be able to do what you want us to do in line with the teaching of your word in jesus name we thank you because we know you have answered in jesus name we pray and everybody said amen thank you very much you can sit down we're looking at the word of god today we're still in the study of the word of god in first thessalonians chapter five i just want to recap a little bit last week we studied about the bible remember b-i-b-l-e that means a blessed information bringing life eternal this word of god is so very important so very essential to your christian life not only here also to when you meet the lord finally and as we study the bible especially in this church you know that we go from book to book and from chapter to chapter because we need to study every Thing. Why do we do that? Look at Second Timothy chapter three, verse sixteen. It says, "All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God." may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's why we go through the Bible and we study every part. In fact, in just one single study, we go to the Old Testament and New Testament and every part of the scripture. And we take everything at face value, not modifying anything, mutilating anything, changing anything, subtracting anything, taking anything away, or adding anything. Why do we do that? Because all scripture no exception, Old Testament, New Testament, all scripture, the promises and the commandments, all scripture, the warnings and the prophecies, everything, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. That actually means that it was breathed out from the very mind of God. And it says it's profitable. So any part of the scripture we're studying you should be asking yourself, what profit am I getting out of this? What gain am I having out of this? And what eternal benefit am I having out of this? And it's profitable profitable number one for doctrine that's how we build the doctrines of the word of god you don't just bring out doctrines out of your own thought out of your own mind and then it says it's profitable for reproof and for correction and then for instruction in righteousness and the purpose is given here it says so that the child of god the, the children of god or it, or it means also the servants of god and the man of god in general will be perfect and truly furnished unto all good works and i pray that the purpose of the lord in providing this word and giving this word will be fulfilled in your life, in my life, in our families too, and in the church, in Jesus' name. I want you to look at Proverbs chapter 13. In Proverbs chapter 30, I'm reading there from verses 5 and 6. It says, every word of God is pure. Isn't that wonderful? Every word of God is pure. By the way, you can only say that about the Bible, this word of God. Every word there, every jot, every title, every sentence, and every paragraph there, everything that is revealed here, every word of God 
is pure. He is a shield to them that put their trust in him. Then it says in verse 6, Art thou not unto his words. What a great commandment there. Art thou not to his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. You know where the liars are going to spend eternity? They're going to spend eternity away from going in the lake of fire. And it says, those who arch to the word, their own ideas, their own opinions, and their own suggestions, instead of the word of God, the Lord is saying judgment is going to come upon them. And the reason we study the word of God is so that we'll be well equipped in times of temptation, in times of trial, in terms of difficulties, will be well, well equipped. In the ch- in the case of the children of Israel, because they were not studying the word, reading the word, obeying the word, and following through the word, see what happened to them. It says in Isaiah chapter five, Isaiah chapter five. I'm reading from verse thirteen. Therefore, my people, they were the people of God. You know, the descendants of Abraham. These were the people that the Lord had covenant with. Yet He said, therefore, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. When somebody says, well, I'm a Christian, I'm a, I'm a child of God, but it's just that I'm not interested in the Bible. I'm not interested in Bible study. All I want is just to come to church on Sunday. How about the Monday study, or maybe you do your own Bible study on Tuesday? It says that the people of God, they go into captivity because they do not have knowledge, and their honorable men are famished, and the multitude dried up with thirst. I thank God in our church over here that is in deeper life, almost in every city and every town, whether we are honorable men, professional men, and great men, and men of worth, and men of authority, we appreciate the Bible study. You know why? Because if we do not appreciate the Bible study, the honorable men and women, it says they are famished because they do not give in or they do not give them, themselves their time unto the study of the word of God. I praise the Lord for you are here today. I praise the the Lord for you are studying the Bible with us every time because it's going to bring great profit and great gain. It will not benefit into your life. In Hosea chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 6. Hosea chapter 4, looking at verse 6, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge because we want to avoid destruction devastation. Want to avoid the ruin that comes upon people that do not have the knowledge of the word of God. That's the reason why we're studying the word every time because it says my people, although they are called the people of God, but because of the lack of knowledge, they are destroyed. You think about people that do not have the knowledge of the promises of God, the knowledge of the providence of God, the knowledge of the provision of God in their lives, destruction comes and when the enemy is coming like a mighty flood, there is nothing, there's no standard. The spirit of God will be able to lift up in their lives, to protect them and preserve them. That's the reason it's so important for you. And it's good you took the decision to come to the Bible study today and you'll keep coming. And as you keep coming, you're going to find out that it strengthens you. It empowers you. And it lays a very strong foundation for your feet as you continue the Christian life. Let's read the whole of that verse. That is, Hosea chapter 4 verse 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I also will reject thee as telling us that the link between us and the almighty God is his word. As we accept that word and believe that word and live by that word and stand on that and defend that word to you. That's the link between us and the almighty God. But he says, because thou hast rejected knowledge, I also will reject thee and thou shalt be no more priest, thou shalt be no priest unto me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I also will forget thy children. What is terrible thing that is. And as you look at Revelation chapter 1, the blessedness of reading the word, the blessedness of observing, obeying the word of God. The Lord has preserved great blessing for us, hearing the word, reading the word, teaching the word, and studying the word, and then applying that word to our lives. Revelation, I'm looking at chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Blessed is he that readeth and did that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. We read, we hear, we study, and we obey and we keep. It tells us in Revelation chapter 22. 
I'm reading from verse 18. Revelation 22 verse 18. For I testify unto every man. Think about that every man now. I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. It says that if we add unto the watch of God, if, you know, adding our own opinion, I think, I feel, I suppose, I suggest all these philosophies of men as we add. It says if we add, we're going to have the plagues and the judgments added unto us. And then it says in verse 19, and if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of those things which are reaching in, out of the holy city and, and also out of those things which are written in this book. What a wonderful thing then as we come together week after week, not taking anything away, not adding anything to it, and we're just studying the word and we're believing the word and obeying the word and I pray the blessing of that study will be upon you and upon me, upon us together as a whole church in Jesus' name. We're now coming to uh, First Thessalonians chapter 5 and I'm reading verses 12, 13, 14 and 15. We're looking at practice practical things today, responsibilities and roles and functions and what the Lord expects of everyone in the church. I'm sure you know that the church, the body of Christ, the church, the flock of God, and the church, the fold of Christ, the church, the bride of Christ, and the temple of the Holy Spirit, the church related to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, the church is not here by accident. It's by divine planning and by divine foundation. The Lord has given us the, has given us the church. I'm not talking about your local church alone. I'm talking about the church in general, the invisible church and the, and the church that we see around us. And it says that we have functions and responsibilities and roles, which is what we're looking at now in chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 12. It says, and I beseech you, brethren. He's talking to the brethren. He's talking to the people that name the name of Christ. He's talking to the people that say they know the Lord. You've been born again. You're a child of God. You are now part of the body of Christ and part of the local church as well as part of the church of the living God. It says, we are brethren. Now, it tells us something to do. It says that as we are here, there's something to know. There's something to do. There's, there's somebody. Uh, you must be somebody in the kingdom. It says, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. And it says, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. In verse 14, now we exhort you, brethren, want them that are ruling and comfort the feeble-minded and support the weak. Be patient toward all men. Verse 15, see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. And that's uh, what we're talking about today. And as you look at your outline, it's talking about practical responsibilities in purposeful relationship relationship. When, when you have a family, there should be a relationship. When you have shepherd and the members, you should have a relationship. When you have pastor and people in the church, there is a relationship. And we're talking about the church, the church that is made up of members of the church and leaders, ministers in the church, the flock of God. And then the body of Christ and the fold of Christ and the bride of Christ and the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is the foundation whose foundation and cornerstone is the Lord Jesus Christ. As the body of Christ, the family of God, the church is not an organization, it is an organism. That means we're closely related together by the very blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The ministers and the members function harmoniously like different parts of the human body. The roles and the responsibilities of the members of the body are ordained of God. And when the members serve and the ministers serve without any conflict and without any friction, what good health we have and then what good growth we're going to have and purposeful existence we're going to have in every local church, the rules, uh, the rules and the responsibilities of the ministers 
and the members have been clearly defined and outlined when ministers and members graciously follow God's revealed will for his family. There will be realization of God's expectation for the church. And some of the things we are saying today and we're learning today will not be new to you, will not be new to those who have been coming to church for some time. But because we are following this a project the Lord has ordained for us done, which is discipling a whole nation. We're planting churches, we're evangelizing, we're bringing people into the church. There are many people that are new in the church now, new converts and the new people that, uh, you know, the Lord has uh, actually called into the kingdom. And I want to say welcome. We really appreciate you, but I want you to understand you're in a family. I want you to understand you're in the fold of Christ. And because of that, you need to know what does the Lord say? Because you see the human family is very much different from the spiritual family. And so we cannot carry our ideas of the human family into the spiritual family. The Lord is telling us that as members of the family of God, there's something to do. There's something to learn. There's something to know. And when you know that and you function appropriately, you'll be blessed. The church will be blessed by your presence in the church and by your participation in all the things that we're doing and then the purpose of the Lord for raising the church will be fulfilled and I pray that in your local church and our church at large this purpose will be fulfilled uninterrupted unhindered in Jesus name we're going to look at three points in the message in the Bible study today number one the minister's responsibilities towards members in the family it's just like I was saying the, the, uh, the responsibilities of the leaders to the followers the responsibilities of the fathers and the mothers in the church and the workers in the church towards the people who are members in the family of god number two members the members response to ministers who are over the flock i think we need to understand that uh, there is a kind of two-way traffic that is the ministers are ministering to the members and the members are ministering also to the ministers it's not just that you know the minister is there the father is there the mother is there they are to do their very best to members of the family and then the members of family do nothing nothing uh, you are the hands and you are the feet and you are the members of the body of christ but then you say you do nothing it's like uh, we think that you know those ministers have to roll. that's what they are paid for that's what they are ordained for and that's what they are put there for and we have nothing to do it's like having a, an active head and a passive body what if your hands are passive and your heart is passive and your eyes you know are dim and then your mouth will say nothing but you know the head is very good the brain is very good what are you going to do with a good brain when the members are all passive and inactive that's what the lord is telling us there are things ministers will do there are things members will do. And then we come to point number three, meaningful relationship among members in the fellowship. Members in the fellowship will have a meaningful relationship. And I pray that as we know these things, the Lord will give us the grace to do them and abide in them in Jesus' name. Did I hear your amen? I said the Lord will help us and we're going to abide. We're going to do everything in Jesus' name. Thank you very much. We're looking at point number one now. The minister's responsibilities towards members in the family. Why don't we come to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And I'm looking at verse 12. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're looking at verse 12. I will beseech you, brethren. I'm sure you understand when he says, we beseech you. It's Paul, the apostle that wrote the letter. But then he said, is writing along with Silas, that is Silvanus, and Timothy. And he's joining those three people together, ministers who have ministered unto them. And he says, we, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, we beseech you, we're pleading with you. And he's talking to them as leaders over, over these people who are brethren, who are children of God. And he says, to know them which labor among you. What do we know of ministers? Number one, the labor among us, the labor in words and doctrine. It goes on to say, and now over you in the Lord, over you in the Lord. It's not talking about over you in the flesh. You know, there are people who are over us in the flesh. You think about a governor in a state. You think about the president in a, in a country. You think about a captain in the army. And you think about a, a teacher, for example, in a school. These are over us in the flesh. You think about 
about uh, other people like a father and mother in the local, in, the, in your normal family. They are over us in the flesh. But this is talking about they are over us in the Lord. Over us in the Lord. And they have some responsibilities in the Lord. And there are things the Lord himself has told those ministers to do. And that is what they ought to do. And then it says in, in that verse, and admonish you. They are admonishing us and that counseling us and advising us and teaching us and instructing us in the way of the Lord. We're going to talk about uh, these responsibilities of the ministers towards the members in the family of God. It says, know them which labor among you. Know them who are over you in the Lord. Know them who admonish you. The ministers refer to are those who labor in word and doctrine. Labor in word and doctrine. It's not talking about the usual labor, the normal labor that we know. Let's look at uh, First uh, Timothy chapter 5. First Timothy chapter 5, I'm reading there from verse 17. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in words and doctrine. They labor in words and doctrine. They're teaching us, they're instructing us, they're directing us, they're guiding us in the word of the Lord. That is the labor, and that is the priority of the minister of the gospel. Not only that, in Colossians chapter 4, verse 12, Colossians chapter 4, verse 12, the labor of these people, the labor in word and labor in, labor in doctrine. Colossians chapter 4, verse 12 says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluted you, always laboring, that's the word, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. And that's the labor of the people of God, of the ministers of the gospel. They labor so that we can be perfect. They labor so that we'll be complete in all the will of God. We're talking about those who are leaders in the fold and those who are pastors in the church and those who are teachers of the word of God and their evangelists and soul winners. They are working so hard and laboring diligently among God's people to feed them with knowledge and understanding. In fact, that's what the Lord promised he was going to do. He was going to give us pastors and teachers and shepherds and leaders that will feed us with knowledge and understanding. If we are pastors, we need to be checking up. Am I doing that? Am I doing that? Uh, there's some people who are called uh, pastors, but you know what they do is all in the physical. Uh, they run around, you know, you call them early in the morning and then they visit the family. They do this and that and they, and they do some social social work and they put some clothes and uh, give some food and all that and they say and then we say what do you do we say some a minister of the gospel a minister of the gospel are you preaching that gospel are you laboring in that gospel are you teaching that word of god the reason why the lord has raised up and has given us the ministry of pastors and teachers of the word of god is so that the word of god will be the priority of our lives in fact you know what the apostles said they said it is not right it is not legit Legitimate. It's not suitable and it is not appropriate for us to leave the teaching of the word and the ministry of the word and prayers and then to be serving tables. And I believe that uh, the, the ministers of today, we need to come back to this. We need to know that the real priority and the thing the Lord is calling us to is to be teachers of the word and preachers of the word. Look at Jeremiah chapter 3 and I'm reading here in verse 15 and I will give you pastors according to my heart which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. That's the purpose of the Lord and that's the plan of the Lord that we will labor in the word and feed the people of God with knowledge. I want to challenge you if you're a pastor. You know that sometimes uh, there are pastors and they are too, they're too, too lazy in what the Lord has called us to do. They cannot teach the word. They will not teach the word. They will not study the word and they will not preach the word of God. All they, do, they might transfer that to other people. Let other people do that. But if we are ministers of the gospel, here there is a responsibility, labor in words and labor in doctrine, and teach the people of God in all in all honesty. We're told in Colossians chapter one verse twenty eight. Colossians chapter one verse twenty eight, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man. 
perfect in Christ Jesus. That we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That's what the Lord has called us to do. And I believe that that's what you are going to do in Jesus' name. Uh, can I say something here now? Uh, as you look at uh, what is happening around us, I'm sure you, you've heard the news about all these things happening in uh, Japan, all the things happening in uh, Libya, the things happening in Tunisia, all the, all the parts of the world, even Australia and Brazil. Sometimes there's a flood and sometimes there's the earthquake and sometimes you have all these explosions and hundreds of people, I should say tens of thousands of people are dying prematurely. That means that all the signs that Jesus gave before his coming, these signs are being fulfilled before our very eyes. That means then the Lord will soon come again. And if the Lord is going to come again and he's soon coming according to what he had said in prophetic utterances and writings, that means the urgent, the important thing now for us ministers of the gospel is to see how to prepare the people of God for the coming of the Lord. We're looking at Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, I'm reading here from verse 17. Preparing the people of God for the coming of the Lord. Look at it, verse 17. And he shall go before him in spirit and power and the power of Elijah, that's Elias, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient unto the wisdom of the just and to make ready a people prepared prepared for the Lord. To make ready a people prepared unto for the Lord. That means then as the Lord is coming. The Lord wants to prepare his people for the coming of the Lord. And it's very important that we realize that, we realize that God himself has appointed you, has appointed me, has appointed us together so that we'll prepare the people of God for the coming of the Lord. Now we're talking about these ministers, you and I, the people are responsible in the, in the church of the living God to lead the people of God and to prepare them to know the Lord. And that, that means then that we should look at our responsibilities very well. I'm looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm reading here from verse, I'm reading from verse, uh, from verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we're looking at it from verse 9. Here it tells us, For we are laborers together with God, where God's husbandry, ye are God's building. It tells us that we are laborers, and that's the way you ought to see yourself. Paul the apostle counted himself as a laborer in the kingdom. And then all the prophets and the apostles and the evangelists and the pastors and the teachers, laborers, but then he says, laborers together with God. It's not like you are laboring all alone by yourself do whatever you want at any time you want to do it and any way you want to do it but we're in partnership with the Lord and it says we're laborers together with God. How do we do that? Look at verse Look at verse 10. It takes the grace of God, the calling of God, the grace of God, the, the, the power of the Lord, the anointing in our lives that makes us to do what we ought to do and it says according to the grace which is given unto me as a wise master builder I have laid the foundation and another builder thereupon but let every man take it how he buildeth thereupon. That's the labor that we actually do. Now, for his, it says, it talks about Paul the Apostle. He says, I have laid the foundation. What did he mean by that? He said, eh, there was no uh, Christian, there was no church in Corinth. But he came there and he planted the church in Corinth. And he said, when I laid that foundation, it was the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I come back again to our brothers and sisters? Praise the Lord for our workers too who are helping us at this time and you are helping the work of the Lord and you are laboring together with God. You are going to places where no churches had been and then you are planting the churches. You are laying foundation actually. And the Lord is saying to be able to do that is not something we do just in our mind in our way, in our strength and power. It's by the grace of the Lord, by the unction of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit of God, the knowledge of the Word of God and the experience we have already in the Lord. And it says in verse 11, for all the foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. It tells us then that as we are laying this foundation, planting churches in the fulfillment of discipling a whole nation, we are laying the foundation, the foundation in Christ, that Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the healer. Jesus is the sanctifier. Jesus is all in all. He is the chief cornerstone. There's no other foundation. We pray to the Father through him. We get the grace through him. Everything is through the Lord Jesus Christ. We who go out of the planet, 
the churches, we are not the saviors, we are not the healers, and we are not the suppliers of the needs of the people. Everything is in Jesus. Jesus only, Jesus ever. Jesus all in all we preach. And then he is our savior, he is our sanctifier, he is our healer, he is our baptizer, and he is the coming king. That's the foundation we are laying in the hearts and the lives of the people. Acts of the Apostles chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 19. Acts chapter 20, we're reading from verse 19. It says, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and many temptations which befell me by the line in wait of the Jews. And then it says, how I kept nothing back that was profitable unto you, but I've showed you and I've, and I've taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. Here is Paul the Apostle. He's saying, this is where I did it. And this is the way that you ought to do it. He has laid a foundation. And then he says, this is how you lay the foundation as well. And the Lord is telling us that we need to do this work with all our heart and all our mind and put everything we've got into the work so that this work will prosper in your hand and prosper in my, in my hand in Jesus' name. Look at verse 28 of that same chapter. It says in verse 28, of this uh, chapter we're looking at now, it says, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. Uh, would you understand then? You know, sometimes uh, people will say, uh, Our state overseer made me an overseer over here, or it's a region overseer that made me an overseer, a pastor over here, or it is the general superintendent that made me an overseer over this country or this other one. But you need to understand, we might be the, history, the human instrument that God has used. But really, this is the Lord that has done it. You think about Paul, the apostle, appointing Timothy, appointing Titus, appointing Epaphroditus, appointing all these people. But then he came back to say, it's not me. It's not me. God just used me as an instrument. And he says, now you take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which, over the, which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, then to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. This church is so precious. I mean, the members of the church and the assembly of godly people, believing people, Bible-believing people, they're so precious. It was Jesus Christ that died for them. And it was Jesus Christ who paid the great price for their redemption. And it says the Lord has now said, take care of them develop them and make them eventually to be who they ought to be by the grace of God and the teaching of the word of God so that they'll be in heaven on that final day. It says we must do that with all our heart and with everything that we have got. And that's the reason why the Lord has raised you up. That's the reason the Lord has raised me up and it says we're to minister to the body of Christ in exactly the same way Paul the apostle ministered. I want you to look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm reading there from verse 10. It says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. What, what, a, uh, what, a, what a kind of trust that gives us and hope that gives us. And what kind of rest of my peace of mind that is giving us. If Paul the apostle was who he was by the grace of God, that grace of God is still there, is still available. And you can be what you ought to be in the kingdom. You can do everything the Lord has called you to do by this same grace. And you too can say, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was given, which was with me. And that verse actually has caught my interest. If you look at that latter part of that verse, and it says, I labored more abundantly than they all. And just thinking about that, you know, Paul the apostle was referred to as an apostle. And he, as an apostle, he labored more abundantly than all the apostles put together. Think about that. And as a writer, you know, he wrote more abundantly than all the writers of the New Testament and even all the writers of the Old Testament. And then as a prophet, he prophesied, he spoke about the rapture, about the great tribulation, about the Antichrist, the son of perdition. And we can say he was a, he was a prophet and he labored in the prophetic ministry more abundantly than all the prophets of the New Testament and even the Old Testament. And we can say he was an evangelist and you think about a man an apostle, a man, a prophet, a man, an evangelist, and you look at his evangelistic outreaches and evangelistic 
impact. And he could say, as an evangelist, I labored more abundantly than all the evangelists of the New Testament. Are you thinking of him being a pastor? He could have said, I am a pastor, Paul, Paul the pastor. And then you could say, as a pastor, I have labored more abundantly than all the pastors in the New Testament all put together. And you're thinking about him as a teacher. And this, uh, Paul the Apostle, he recognized the Lord has ordained me and has put me in the ministry of a minister, of an apostle, of a prophet, and of a teacher. And he could say he labored more abundantly than all the teachers of the New Testament. If God could do that through a man who was an injurious man before his conversion, was a persecutor before his conversion, what God has done through him, he can do also through you in the name of the Lord, and he will do it in Jesus' name. I said it will do it in Jesus' name. I'm coming now to point number two. And it's the member's response to ministers who are over the flock. We're coming back to First Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5. And I'm reading here now from verse, I'm reading from verse 12. And then I'll go on to verse 13. First Thessalonians chapter 5. We're reading from verse 12. It says, and we beseech you, brethren. This is a message to the brethren, to the brothers and to the sisters. It's a message to the people who are members of the flock and members of the body of Christ. We beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. And then it says in verse 13, to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. Uh, you look at what the apostle is saying here and he's talking to these uh, people who are members of the church and to you I also speak from this word of God. We're members of the, bo of the body of Christ and members of the church, members of the local church too and it says number one, know them. Number one, know them. That means you recognize the leaders and the teachers God has put over you. you. You know, sometimes there are people that will not recognize their local pastor. They will not know their local pastor. They will not respect and esteem their local pastor. And there is a pastor that preaches over the television. They don't have any direct contact with him. They send all their, all their tithes and all their offering. That is the one they know. But it says your local pastor, the person who is ministering to you every time, know them, recognize Recognize them, love them, appreciate them, esteem them. And uh, it says over here that we are to understand that they labor over us. And uh, sometimes it's a uh, you know, radio minister that somebody knows. He says, you, that's my man, that's my minister. And you know, when he speaks over the radio, I just love that man. You've never seen him. You don't know his private life, his family life, but the one that you know. The Lord is telling us. And what the Lord is saying, that's what we ought to do. We shouldn't modify the word of God. We shouldn't kind of... Uh, adjust the word of God and say my allegiance is to this and that. And there are people who are even members of our church here. You're a member of Deeper Life Bible Church and uh, the leaders in Deeper Life Bible Church, no respect for them and no honor for them, no esteem for them. But then there's a minister in another, in another church. You read their books, you listen to their tapes and I'm asking, why are you here? And why is it that you say this is my local church and there's no recognition for your local pastor and it's somebody that you know you don't know in an another church and our denomination that you are giving your allegiance and loyalty to. Let's come back to the Bible. If we are brethren and if we are members of this local church, the local church that you belong to, it says you will know them that labor over you. They labor among you. Not that they're laboring somewhere in a foreign land. You cannot tell. And it says because they're laboring there and they're over you in the Lord and admonish you from day to day, from week to week, from year to year. They're laboring over you that they'll present you perfect and complete in the will of God. It says and to esteem them very highly and for their war's sake and be at peace among yourselves. Let me come back to deeper life here. You know sometimes in a, in a church in deeper life, a pastor is here now and then God uh, removes him and takes him to another church. A church that has um, a church that has another meaning, a church that is another place and in that other place it's been transferred to go to that other place and do something very great and something wonderful. But then you you are here. As you are here, we we'll bring another pastor here, and your loyalty is still to the old pastor who has gone on to a better ministry, a greater ministry. And the one that is ministering to you now, you don't recognize such a minister. The Lord is saying that is not the appropriate attitude. It says we we'll beseech you, brethren. You are members of this local church. The other pastor is transferred. The other pastor is gone. You're not the one that is still writing to the other pastor, seeking counseling, you know, with the other pastor. And then he said, you know, all your prayer requests is still going to 
the other party says no. That's the wrong attitude. That the one that is there now, the one that is ministering to you right now, that is the one you have to recognize. It says, we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you. In the present day, they're still laboring and they're still, you know, watching over us and they're praying for us. It says, oh, they are laboring over us and they're over us in the Lord and they're admonishing us. Esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. Now, you know something the Lord is saying that it's your teacher who is there now. Oh, what if, you know, when you went to school that, uh, you know, you now come to a new class and then you have a new teacher there, but your teacher was there about three years ago. Is the one you are still taking out your assignment to, to mark your paper to do everything. You'll never be able to get out of school with a good grade. But the one who is there now, you concentrate on that one and then grade will be your benefit and your profit in the kingdom in Jesus' name. I said, you'll be blessed in Jesus' name. Look at that verse, verse 13. It says, esteem them very highly in love for their worst sake and be at peace among yourselves. I'm looking at, I'm looking at uh, Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. And we're looking at verse 26. Acts chapter 20. We're looking at verse 26. Here in verse 26, Paul the Apostle is telling us about the quality of life that he had and the quality of ministry that he had over the church and is transferring that to us and he's saying that's the kind of quality of ministry we ought to have. Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. I'm reading from verse 26. Wherefore, I take you to record this day and uh, for that I'm pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shown to declare unto you all the counsel of God. What a great minister that was, and what a faithful, loyal minister that was, that he was faithful. He was so faithful that everything that he ought to tell the people, teach the people, counsel the people, he did everything according to the word of the Lord. And he said, I have not shunned, I have not neglected in teaching you and declaring to you all the counsel of God. And then he says in verse 20, take heed therefore for unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God uh, which, a, which he has purchased with his own blood. And then he tells us in verse 31, in verse 31 it says, therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn and to teach everyone night and day with tears. What will be your response to such a minister that labors over us in prayer, labors over us maybe in even prayer and fasting, labors over us in teaching, labors over us in admonition, labors over us in directing us and guiding us by the word of the Lord and leading us in the right direction. It says that the kind of attitude we ought to have is to be, to be obedient to such leaders and then to respond very well and esteem them and honor them, appreciate them, exalt them too. I'm looking at Romans. Romans chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6, they, they have taught us the word of God. And as they teach us the word of God, what's to be the response of the strength to the teacher, the response of the sheep to the shepherd, the response of the children to their father, to their mother, the response of those who are led to those who are leading them. In Romans chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 17. Romans chapter 6 from verse 17, but God be thanked that she was servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which is which was delivered unto you. It says we have obeyed from the heart. Think about that. Here the joy of the apostle, the joy of the pastor, the joy of the shepherd here is that he was teaching. That was his responsibility. And then they were obedient. That was their response. You get those two words. Number one, the responsibility of the ministers. Number two, the response of the members. That the members were obedient. And it was not a superficial obedience. The obedience Bade from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto them. And then it tells us in verse 18, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. That was the response. All the old life that was sinful, all the old life that was dirty, all the old life that was unacceptable to the Lord, they, that was cleansed up and that was forgiven and that was changed, that was transformed. And now they became now free from sin and then they became the servants of righteousness. I'm reading on to verse from verse 19 now i 
speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. It's talking about because of the weakness of your understanding. It's not making some illustration and it's saying for as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity and to, unto iniquity even so now yield your members servants to righteousness and unto holiness. For when we were the servants of sin ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in these things whereof ye were ye are now ashamed for the end for the end of those things is death. Look at verse 20. But now, what a wonderful thing. But now, every time I read those two words in the New Testament, it says, Here is what you were in the past, but now in the present. You were following after sin before, but now you are following the Savior. You were in darkness before, but now you are in the light. You were children of Satan or servants of Satan before, but now you are the children of God. Those two words very important. But now, a change are taking place, a transformation are taking place. But now being made free from sin be, uh, and become the servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. And that's a challenge for members of the church, for the people who are members of the body of Christ, that old things are passed away and all things have now become new. It says, but now, what a great and glorious change the Lord has wrought because there is a but now in your life, in my life, in our lives together. And I pray that it will be visible to your neighbors and visible to, to the people or members of your family that will they will know that this is what you are but now by the grace of God by the transforming power of the Lord this is what you are now I'm looking at first Thessalonians chapter chapter one first Thessalonians chapter one we're reading from verse five these people the gospel came unto them uh, just like the new churches were planting and the new churches that are being raised up right now these new churches that are being raised up the, the Lord is telling us there should be the response of grace, the response of fruitfulness in our lives because of what the Lord has done. And you have repented of your sins, you have come to the Lord, now a new church is there, you are, you are members of that new church. What's your lifestyle? What's the response? What's the attitude? And what are the things that you are doing now? Very new, very different from what you were before. First Thessalonians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 5, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance as ye you know what manner of men we were among you for your sakes. He said the gospel came unto you. They were in their sin, they were in their evil, in their native cell, but then the gospel came unto them. And when the gospel came unto them, how did they respond to that gospel? Look at verse 6. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction. We with joy of the Holy Ghost. Sometimes there's persecution. And you're thinking about the local church you belong to. You just planted that church. And because you were in darkness before, in idolatry before, and all those uh, sacrifices you are making with them, you cannot do that anymore. And so these people now, they want to persecute you. Just like it was with the Thessalonian believers that they came to the Lord. They became followers of the Lord and followers of the leadership, not only, not only in much affliction. And it says so that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord. Word, uh, the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God's word is spread abroad so that we need not speak anything. It's saying that the word of God was so clear in them and it so came through them that their neighbors could tell, their neighbors could see the change, the transformation that are taking place. Can we say that a about you as an individual. Can we say that about you as a local church, this new church that I mean planted, and then the church that I mean there for a long time, the year old timers, can we say that about you? Have we gone back to, you know, the regular life of the neighborhood, regular life of the traditional people, regular life of the backsliding churches, or are we still up and running with real bright vision, with the grace of God in our lives, and then with the change of life that is still present and relevant even today. Look at it in verse 9 it says for they themselves show of us uh, what manner of entering in we add unto you how ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead even Jesus which delivered us from the wrath to come 
it tells us about these Thessalonian believers that the change that was wrought in them was so real, was so very clear to their neighbors and to everyone that a change had been wrought. And the Lord is telling us the same thing that we too we should manifest that change, that transformation that people around us will see. That's a new believer. That's a new creature, and that's a new church, and that's a new family, because they can see the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. I'm looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. The kind of change that came. How did that change come? The kind of change that came, how did that transformation, the, the new creation, and the power, the grace, how did that happen in their lives? Look at it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. For this cause also, thank we God without ceasing, because when ye receive the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Uh, there's a lot in that verse. The word of God came unto them. And then it says, number one, they received the word of God, not as the word of men. Yes, Paul the Apostle talking. Yes, Silas, Silvanus talking. Yes, Timothy teaching. But then they knew. They were just vessels. They were channels. They were pipes through which the water of life was flowing unto them. And he said, yes, I know it's Timothy talking. Yes, I know it's Paul talking. Yes, I know it's Silvanus talking. But I know it is the word of God. They received the word as the word of the Lord. And then it says, it worked effectually in them. It worked powerfully in them. And it, it touched every part of their lives. And when it touched their lives, it just turned them around and changed them completely. And that's the way it ought to be in our lives. That was their response to the word. And because they responded appropriately and properly to the word of God, that's why the change was made. And that change will be made in your life, in my life, in the lives of all the hearers of the word of God together. When we respond like those Thessalonians responded. In Philippians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 25. Philippians chapter 2, verse 25, he said, yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, and companion in labor. And then he says, and fellow, fellow soldier, for your, uh, but your messenger, and he that ministered to my wants, for I longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick for indeed he was sick nigh unto death but god had mercy on him and not only on, on him not on him only but also on me lest i should have sorrow upon sorrow i sent him therefore the more carefully that when ye see him again ye may rejoice and that i may be the less sorrowful receive him therefore in the lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation it says that you are members of the philippian church i'm sending one of the ministers unto you it's being your minister your fellow minister in fact he supplied my necessities he's worked along with me and his work not thinking and not counting his own health and not counting his own gain and even though he's been like that now he's well by the grace of god and now that he's up and running again he's coming unto you what's your response what are you going to do how are you going to respond to such a person and to such a minister that gives his life and gives everything that is God to minister to the people of God you receive him verse 29 therefore you receive him in the Lord with all gladness and then you hold such in reputation we're looking at um, Hebrews chapter 13 Hebrews chapter 13 I'm reading from verse 7 Hebrews chapter 13 verse 7 here is what the word of the Lord is saying and it's what the Lord is saying to you who are members of the church your response to your local pastor your response to your local overseer, overseer in your nation or in your on your region it says in verse 7 in verse 7 it says remember them which have which have rule over you and then it says who have spoken unto you the word of god whose faith follow considering the end concerning the purpose of their conversation it says we should remember them remember them in prayer don't only really remember them in prayer. Remember the word they preach unto you. And then you follow through on that. Look at verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you. And submit yourselves for the word for your souls. As, so, as they that must give account. That they may do it with joy and not with grief. 
for that is unprofitable for you. It says that they'll do it with joy. It's just telling you like, you know, as if you had a doctor. And that doctor is to treat you. And then if you make him unhappy and he's treating you with unhappiness and with sorrow, you're not going to get the best treatment. But if you live in such a way that the doctor says, I'm so happy that you're my patient and I'm your doctor and I just want to do my best to make sure you're in perfect health, you're going to be the, you're going to have the gain for that. He says the same thing, you're going the same attitude and the same response you are going to have towards your local pastor. The one that is ministering to you every time so that you'll see that you know you keep saved and you keep sanctified and the power of God is upon your life. The protection of the Lord is upon your life. He said, obey them that have the rule over you. It's uh, on the assumption that they are laboring in the word of God. They're not going to tell you anything which is not in the word of God. They're not going to tell their own opinions and their own private ideas. They're not going to lead you into false doctrine or anything that is evil. And why while they're teaching us the word of God, what are we to do? Obey them. They have the rule over us and they're guiding us and submit yourselves because they're watching over your souls. Let them do it with joy. They're going to give account unto the Lord. And when you do it with joy, they do it according to the word of the Lord. The blessing will be upon them and the blessing will be upon us too in Jesus' name. It's telling us that the members of the local church and to love and to honor their shepherds. They are to honor, they are to love their pastors. Indeed, we are to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. We are not to dishonor them, we are not to slander them, we are not to belittle them, we are not to despise them. We are to esteem them very highly and we are to love them with a pure heart fervently. It is God who has set those pastors apart to fulfill unique ministries in our lives. So, he commands us to lovingly act knowledge and lovingly appreciate their ministry labors and then greatly respect them graciously overlooking their non sinful human frailties. Uh, can I say that again? The Lord is saying overlook their non sinful human frailties and generally respect their ministries and continually pray for them and sincerely speak well of them, positively encouraging and positively and constantly giving your very best service to their ministries. So so that they can be effective. I need to clear up that thing I said now, which I read from the outline, that we overlook the non sinful traits of frailties of our pastors, of our leaders. Uh, you, you know, sometimes, uh, if you look at Paul the Apostle, Paul the Apostle has some human, what we'll call human frailties, but you know, the, the, the believers that actually received this ministry, they didn't look at that, those non sinful uh, human frailties. I'm looking at Galatians, Galatians chapter 4. In Galatians, Galatians chapter 4, I'm reading to you from a verse, uh, from verse, uh, from verse uh, 13. Galatians chapter 4, verse 13. It says, you know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. He was saying, yes, I'm an apostle. That's a spiritual thing. That's a spiritual gift. But coming to the flesh, he had infirmity in the flesh. And then it says in verse 14, and my temptation, which was in my flesh, ye despised not nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. And as Paul the Apostle, he had some, you know, some infirmity in the flesh and some temptation in the flesh that the people, they just overlooked that. They said that's a non-sinful sin. That, that has no sin in it. And because it's a non-sinful frailty, they need to make much of that. But, you know, the detractors, the people that wanted to persecute him, they made much of that. Look at Second Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 1. Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence I am based among you, but being absent, I am bold toward you. He said, my presence, he had a weak uh, presence. When you look at his stature and you look at, um, you know, his uh, kind of physique, it wasn't uh, an imposing uh, stature or imposing physique, but that's a non sinful trait or frailty. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, it says, uh, look at of that same chapter, for his letters they say are witchy and powerful, 
but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. You see, well, that's what the Lord is telling us that we're not to look at those, you know, the, the first speech or the idiosyncrasies or whatever it is, which are not sinful things. Overlook all that and then see the spiritual thing and still respect your pastor, respect your leader, respect your overseer because the Lord has called him to be your minister, to be your pastor, to be your overseer. And I pray that as we do that in obedience to the word of the Lord, the blessings of the Lord will be upon us and then these leaders that are laboring over us, they'll labor over us and prepare us for a great, wonderful eternity in Jesus' name. I'm coming to point number three now. We're talking about meaningful relationship among members in the fellowship. We're coming to First Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 14 and 15. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 14 and 15. Now, we exhort you, brethren, Want them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble minded. Support the weak. And be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man. But ever follow that which is good. Both among yourselves and to all men. And that's what the Lord is saying about the relationship that we ought to have among the members of the church, among the people that actually have been fellowshipping in the church. Meaningful relationship. It's not just a relationship that is there. It's so-so relationship. A kind of relationship that had no consequence at all, but meaningful and powerful, true and gracious, that is helping people to say, I thank God I'm a member of the church. I thank God that he is ministering to me. I thank God that she is ministering to me as well. In a good family, all the instruction, all the encouragement, all the admonition, all the support are not led with the father or the mother. All the members assist and support one another as needs arise. So also it is in the church. It says uh, the, the family of God. All the admonition, all the encouragement, all the support and all the intercession, all the correction, they are not left in the hands of the ministers or only members of the church share in the responsibility and the brethren they want them that are ruling the brethren they comfort the full minded those brethren support the weak and those brethren are patient toward all men and that's what the lord is telling us if you look at what the lord is calling us to uh, let me pick them up one by one number one look at verse 14 it says exhort we exhort you brethren that you want them that are unruly when it says we want them that are unruly what does it mean to be unruly? That means to be disorderly. That means to be insubordinate, to, to act in an insubordinate manner. And those are the people that walk contrary to God's prescribed way of life. Those are the people that are walking in the opposite direction to a law abiding, a spirit guided congregation. The brethren are to warn, the brethren are to correct, the brethren are to admonish those who are unsupportive, those who are contentious members, and, do, and to alert them of their danger and eternal consequence of their God dishonoring action. Uh, let's look at what the word of God is saying about the warning. It tells us in Ezekiel chapter 3. Ezekiel chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 18. Ezekiel chapter 3. We're looking at verse 18. That you as a member of the church, you know somebody a member of the church is doing something that is unruly. Something contrary to the word of God. Something you know very clearly that this is not according to the teaching of the word of God. Oh you say I'm not a minister, I'm not a, I'm not a pastor and since I'm not a shepherd, I'm just a member of the church, what can I do about that? Of course you have to do something about that because it says we exhort you brethren that you want the people who are unruly. Uh, come and look at Ezekiel chapter 3 I'm reading from verse 18 there Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 18 when I say to the wicked, thou shalt surely die and thou givest him not warning nor speaketh to warn the wicked from the wicked way, from his wicked way to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Look at verse 19. Yet if thou want the wicked and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. You know why some people don't even try to correct anybody, warn anybody, instruct anybody, challenge anybody? They're not listening. 
They will not hear. And because they're not going to respond, why am I wasting my time? You're not wasting your time. You're being the Lord. Leave the response in the hands of the people. You're a member of the church. We are to join together, ministers and members together, to make everybody sit right and sit straight and talk right and live right according to the word of the Lord. And don't you ever give up. And don't you ever say, they will not listen. And since they're not going to listen, what am I going to do? You have something to do. He says, if you want them, and they will not listen yet to have delivered your own soul. Look at verse 20. Again, when a righteous man does turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin. And his righteousness, which he has done, shall not be remembered. But his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou want, the righteous man, that the righteous sin not, and he does not sin, he shall surely live because he is warned. Also, thou hast delivered thy soul. Let's come back to First Thessalonians chapter 5. It tells us the first responsibility from member to members and from one to another is that we warn the unruly. It goes on in that same verse 14. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14, comfort the feeble-minded. That's the next thing what you do. It says we comfort the feeble-minded. What does that mean? It means the faint-hearted. It means the people that are fearful. You know, they're fearful of people. They're fearful of problems. They're fearful of circumstances. They're fearful of uh, some perplexities. They're easily perplexed and easily confused. And such people, it says that we should get near them, encourage them, build them up, support them, and you comfort them. Comfort the feeble minded and that's what the lord is saying to us that those people that do not know what they ought to know sometimes it is the tradition of the church there and they're coming from that is making them so fearful and uh, well, let me come back again to this uh, dawn that uh, god is uh, you know uh, doing through us now that is discipling the whole nation and i'm sure that in your locality you've seen that our teachers our leaders our pastors whether it's district pastor or group uh, group uh, pastor is uh, telling us we're going to plant uh, five churches, uh, you know, this quarter we're going to do this and that. And these new churches, uh, many people that have been in some religious organizations and denominations, they are coming to know the Lord. And then the old church, they were going where there was no salvation. The old church, they were going where there was no teaching of the word of God. Some of those people, prophets, uh, are threatening them. If you live like that, I'm telling you that this is going to happen. And then you'll see me the dream, you'll see me the day, and then your life will be like this, like that, and all the problems that have been taken taking away before they're just hanging there and the moment you leave this uh, church all those problems are coming back on you and then these people they're new converts they're afraid they say what do i do now this new life of god this new salvation of god do i go back to the old religious uh, place no you will not go back you'll stay where you are and then we have brothers and sisters who have gone through that before and you're encouraging the people that's what the lord is saying there are people who are feeble-minded and there are people who are, fr- who are kind of fearful and faint-hearted and we are going to them and we're helping them so that they'll be able to stand. And I pray that as we help them together, they will stand in Jesus' name. Look at Romans chapter 14. I'm reading there from verse 21. Romans chapter 14. We're looking at verse 21. It says, it is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor any sin whereby thy brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. You see the people that have just come to know the Lord, they don't understand many things and you not say well i'm at liberty i'm going to do whatever i want to do whether there are new converts or not no you cannot do that you want to be conscious of those new converts and you want to say if i do this what will be the impact on those new converts if i go this direction what will be the impact on those new converts i've been in the church for a long time i know this is all right and this is not all right and i know how to live my life and those things little things don't bother me yes they don't bother you but they bother these new converts that's why it's saying in chapter 15 of Romans. Romans chapter 15 from verse 1. It says, We then that are strong ought to bear the ought to, uh, ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. It's saying that those of us who are strong, you've been in the Lord for a long time and some of the things that bother the new converts, they don't bother you at all. It says you will not allow that uh, to make you take liberty for license. You're going to protect the interests of those young converts. 
Uh, that's why he's telling us that we need to uh, comfort those who are feeble minded. I'm coming back to First Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5, and I'm reading there from verse 14. In the latter part of that verse 14, it says, Support the weak. Support the weak. Don't please, don't please yourself. Uh, there are things you need to deny yourself of. There are some things, maybe they are legitimate, maybe they are all right, maybe they are just non essentials. But to the people who are relating with you and to the people who are just members of the church and new converts, maybe some even old converts too. Some of the old converts have their own peculiarities and some things weaken them, weaken their faith and weaken their understanding and weaken them even bodily. And it says that you're not going to do anything that will make the weak to become weaker, but you will do things that will make the weak to become stronger. Look at the end of that verse 14 and be patient toward all men patient toward all men. There are quick learners and they are slow, slow, slow learners. And you want to be patient towards those uh, slow learners. Not only that, in problems, in situations, when people get so, to some situations, uh, they are easily irritated and easily having this problem, that problem. You are going to be patient towards them. You are not saying you are like those teachers. You will never learn. Because I have told you before, I am saying this for the, you know, maybe for the 17th time. Why do you, don't you learn? It says, we who understand better well to be patient towards all men. Then it says in verse 15 see that none render evil for evil unto any man but ever follow that which is good among yourselves and then it says unto all men. What a great thing the Lord is telling us there. We're looking at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 I'm reading from verse 17. Romans chapter 12 reading from verse 17. The action, the activity, and the behavior, the lives of the fruit that we ought to bear as the people of God, as the children of God, so that the new life the Lord has given us they will really see that this is the new life, and the new life is actually is visible, that other people can see, other people can tell, see what the Lord has done. I'm reading from Romans chapter 12, reading from verse 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. You see, that is the conclusion of the thing now is saying our responsibilities members to mem members to members and ministers to members and members of the ministers too in the flock of Christ and the church of the living God in the assembly of the people who are righteous who have been born again it says we have relationship one to another should be a meaningful relationship you as a minister how are you relating how are you acting to the members of the church and we who are members how are we responding to the ministers who are ministering over us and then for members to member, brother to sister, and sister to brother, and sisters to sisters, and brothers to brothers. How are we relating together? He says this is the conclusion of the whole matter. In verse 17, recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as it lies in you, live peaceably with all men. Oh, some people say, the Bible says, if it be possible, live peaceably with all men. Well, it's not possible, so I cannot live peaceably with him or with her. What he's saying is, on your own side, do everything possible. He is the one to make it impossible if it's not, if it's not going to be possible. But on your own side, if it be possible, be at peace with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. Isn't that the great problem that people have, you know, members have? Sometimes a member will say, that pastor did this to me, that minister did this to me, he misunderstood me and they said something, he didn't check up and he just just had a negative attitude towards me. All right. If he's a minister, if he's a pastor, if he's a preacher, if he's an overseer, and he said that and did that towards me without checking up, I'm going to throw it at him as well. He says, don't do that, dearly beloved. Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. He says, leave it in my hand. You know, sometimes you find in society that what a judge should do, the individuals that are doing that, and uh, what a policeman should do. There are some people, the civilians that are doing that. And the Lord is saying that will not be right. The responsibility of the policeman is just his responsibility. And the responsibility of the judge is his responsibility. And you're not going to take laws into your hand and do what a policeman should have done, what a judge should have done. The same thing, God says, I am the judge. And he's the final judge. And he says, I will repay, says the Lord. 
therefore, because of that, because you are not taking loss into your hand, because you know that's God's area, that's God's choice, and that's God's work, and that's God's, uh, that's God's prerogative. Because of that, here is man. Mine is to love, and mine is to esteem, and mine is to respect and to honor. It says, therefore, if an enemy hunger, feed him. And if he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. We're going to live in such a, in such a Christian way and gracious way and righteous way and holy way and commendable way in Jesus' name. Let's come back now to First Thessalonians chapter 5 and see what the Lord has taught us today and what the Lord wants us to take home and what the Lord wants to be, wants us to make a part of our lives. It says from verse 12, we beseech you, brethren, know them which labor among you, know your pastors, know your shepherds, know your overseers, know them, know your leaders, know them which labor over you and over you in the Lord and admonish you. Our leaders should keep on admonishing, our leaders should keep on teaching, our leaders should keep on feeding the people of God, the, uh, the flock of God and esteem them very highly. Those of us who are members, we keep on uh, honoring and respecting and este esteeming the people of God, the, the men of God, the women of God very highly in love for their own sake, not because of their stature, not because of their physique, and not because of their education, not because of anything, but because of their work. And be at peace among yourselves, and now among us who are members, we exhort you that you want the unruly, that you comfort the feeble-minded, that you support the weak, that you are patient to all men, and that you don't render evil for evil for anyone at all, but ever follow that which is good among yourselves and to all men. And I pray that the Lord will make all these things visible and constant in our lives in Jesus' name. Thank you very much. We're going to pray now. You rise up on your feet and then we'll pray together. You want to close your eyes. You want to recollect everything everything that we have learned today, and you want the Lord to make this a part of your life, so that by the grace of God, as we are studying from week to week, then the Lord will be improving, will be helping us to move forward and increasing the things of the Lord in the love of the Lord, and it will happen in Jesus' name. Pray and talk to the Lord. You see what, where we started? We spoke about the word of God. is given by inspiration, and because it's given by inspiration, it's profitable, it's good. There's a gain here. Profitable for doctrine, Profitable for reproof, profitable for correction. There are some things so far today that might have corrected your life, corrected your relationship, and corrected what your response to your minister. And we who are ministers correcting also the way we label and the way we do the work. Do we do it carelessly or carefully, thoughtfully or thoughtlessly? Let us uh, recollect what we have learned today and then let this word lead us to actually be better than before we came in here. Talk to the Lord and say, Lord, I want this lot will refashion me, remodel me, reform me, and transform me completely. It will, it will. We as ministers, we need this more grace in our lives, more unctions in our lives, and more power in our lives, and more determination, dedication, discipline to do what the Lord is calling us to do. You are telling the Lord, Oh Lord, make me a better minister, and make me a more responsive member, and make me a person that has meaningful relationship with my pastor, with my overseer, a more meaningful relationship, pure relationship relationship and holy relationship profitable relationship Christ honoring relationship with my ministers and with my pastor with my overseer and then we who are ministers to more meaningful relationship with our members, members of the church a holy relationship, righteous relationship between the pastor and those sisters in the church and the pastor and those men in the church and the pastor and those children, young people in the church and you young people, why don't you pray that God will help you, that all this that we have learned and the very evidence of salvation, being born again, new life in Christ, that the Lord himself will make this visible visible in your life that will not be wondering is he a christian is she a christian is uh, he a believer is she a believer well no very clearly like we knew about the first thessalonian believers that those people who are christians and paul the apostle said i can testify of them because of the work of faith and because of the labor of love and because of the patience of hope that i see in them they turned away from idols to serve the true and the living god let your salvation be like that that's the paul paul 
Paul the Apostle today and then the, the Silvanus and the Timothy of today will be able to say, yes, I know him. Yes, I know her. That person has come to know the Lord and will really appreciate the grace of God in his life and the grace of God in her life. You tell the Lord, oh Lord, make me the kind of Christian ought to be changed and transformed and a new creature in Christ. And then the people who are weak, why don't you support them? And the people who are faint-hearted and feeble-minded, why don't you help them and comfort them? The people who are unruly, the people who are disobedient, the people who are disorderly, the people who were contrary to the word of God we're learning. Why don't you, you know, get up and do what the Lord has told us to do? You want them. Don't just say, well, the pastor will hear one day, the overseer will hear one day, and when he hears, then he will do the right thing. We're praying for the pastor. We're praying for overseer that you will see these people that are just, they're just uh, superficial people. They come into the church, destroying the name of the Lord at home. You know it. We don't know it. And you are the person God has raised up beside that individual. Want them and tell them, correct them and speak to them so that they will change their seed, their lives, and then their lives will be according to the word of the Lord. Tell the Lord, help me, Lord, and give me the grace to be all I want I ought to be. And we who are ministers, you see Paul the Apostle, you see the way he ministered, and he said, I labored more abundantly than all the other apostles, all the other prophets, all the other evangelists, and all the other pastors and teachers. Why don't you tell the Lord, Lord, I want to do more. I want to do more. I want to go further so that I can speak. I can testify like Paul the Apostle. I've labored more abundantly than they all. Except we pray, the Bible says it will just be in our head. Is the prayer that transfers what we have learned into our heart. And then we're able to go back home and we're able to say, thank you, Lord, I learned something today. And what I'm learning today, Lord, I want you to make it so much part of my life that people will be able to read the Bible through me. The Lord has taught us about these practical responsibilities. It's not just something to learn and quietly just preserve and uh, just, you know, keep with us. It's something that we're going to do when we go back home and in our places of work and people will know we're being at the study and we're being with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray the fruit of real diligent study of the word will be in your life, will be in my life and all our lives together.